Harvey. Thank you, Chair. And Claire, I remember sitting there 10 years ago, 11 years ago, with Brian previous before that, and the, the presentation can almost repeat itself year on year on year. And so I think really the, the question I want to ask you, and where I'd like to drill a little bit, is to say what lies beneath that? Because we could repeat a lot of the lines, and I think, as you've highlighted yourself, it's beneath that where, where the proof of the pudding is, really. One of the things I think that I find interesting sat here as a substitute member is listening to you present your presentation and then sit listening to the debates around PNI, and in particular the last debate on PNI, where the Critical Fem report was given. And one of the things that was interesting about that report was the demographic changes for our workforce, and in particular the contraction that we're going to see of working age people on the basis of the current direction of travel and the need to address that economically if we want to carry on in exactly the way you propose. Or we build our economy towards an ageing workforce, the 60 to 70 year olds, and encourage them to, to become, as it were, a much, much larger part of our workforce. Now that was the debate around the table at PNI, linked to the local plan, linked to the housing numbers, linked to everything, because A leads to B leads to C leads to D. And I'd appreciate your view on how you translate that very different debate that had very different conclusions to what you said tonight. Well, I'm glad you found it a useful thing because um, I watched it um, on the web webcast, and what I thought it was was really useful was it does help when you get real professional help and support involved in these things, um, rather than trying to do it ourselves or all become experts in demographic um, analysis, which none of us are. Um, to the level that they were. So it, it's positive. Um, I get a little bit concerned when you talk about sort of the 60s and 70 year olds um, and they might still be working. Um, some of us still are, it seems to me. And, um, and actually, when you think about it, you know, we're still working and we don't intend to stop working. So there is an element at which the whole ageing thing is, is moving forward, but necessarily the functions that you carry out are still perfectly capable of being, being carried out. But if, I mean, horrendous thought that you've actually got to look forward to another 20 or 30 years of life after that when you stop, um, it, well, clearly we are going to have to provide different sorts of facilities um, for people to cope with that lifespan. But we can only provide those provided we've got a good working population in whatever fashion that might, however that might be provided. So it is a question of making sure that we do have a really good business community running that. That is the motor that moves everything forward, I think. And to, what do they need to have? I mean, business can be in different areas. Leisure can be when providing the facilities for the older, the aging population to live and enjoy themselves during that period. They're not necessarily disabled because they're older. Providing them those facilities is actually a business in itself. So that can of itself recycle wealth, can recycle um, economic activity. Um, clearly, what was right for us 10 years ago, if you were having these same discussions 10 years ago, uh, I was still working 10 years ago in business, um, that what was right then wouldn't necessarily be right now, looking at the, the demographic patterns going forward. And I'm sure there will be somebody sitting in where I'm sitting and somebody's different sitting where you, or you might still be here, um, but it certainly won't be me, in 10 years' time having the same, uh, having similar discussions, but with a slightly different perspective. What we enjoy now is what was put in place 20 or 30 years ago. And I think we owe it to the people who are going to be here in 20 or 30 years time, not to sit around discussing it forever and a day, but to get on and put some things in place for them, for the future. And that's what this is really about, saying there are some things here that we can, we can agree about the, the dressing around it and some of the peripheral things, but there are some key things here that we need to have, we need to do, we need to get on with, uh, and hopefully we can persuade everybody to, to, to push together, because that way we become a much more attractive proposition to outside investors who, whether we like it or not, we can have to attract to help us pay for all this and finance. Thank you, Chair. Um, here where Clive is coming from with this and appreciate what you're saying. When you talk to the business community, the one thing that they... <laughs> People in their ringtones, it's a... 
Aduh. <laughs> yes. I like it. I like it. It's, that's fine. I was going to say when you, when we talk to the business community, I think that the four things that we've picked up that they've identified are issues for them. It's very important in terms of small business access to finance, and in Basingstoke, as in around the country, but particularly for our small business sector, that is still a major issue for them. The second thing is public sector cuts impacting on the private sector itself. And that is a big issue, again, for a lot of the smaller businesses, but still some of the big ones as well. And that is having an effect in terms of their ability to sustain themselves in the private sector because of the cuts to the public sector. Skills and infrastructure, like you've highly said. Now, the issue there that we've, I think is really important, and again, we've not raised it here, youth unemployment and the skills gap. And they are issues in Basingstoke that are genuine because they're real life issues, I think, that we pick up in casework. And finally, innovation and where we can you know, foster innovation. Now, maybe 3EN was not the right model. Totally appreciate criticisms of that. But the intent and the, the design behind it was, and um, where's the replacement? Where's the, the initiative, if you like, to see that followed through? And finally, just I think the other bit that does have a relevance to us is another two and a half billion pounds in cuts. Where is that going to hit in terms of service provision and support that we can offer? Where does that hit in terms of real life issues that employees, that the workforce are going to face simply to sustain themselves, to get through what's coming down the line? And I'm sorry, but front pages like today, uh, on Monday, uh, with the Gazette, don't sell basic stoke, and they don't do us any favours when we have a deputy leader of the council kicking our local schools. And I thought that was disgraceful. So as leader of the council, I'd like to ask you tonight, what is your view of what was said in the Gazette? Because you're talking about marketing us, and you're talking about putting forward the best image, and that certainly, most certainly, was not. You're not sorry. You're not sorry at all. <laughs> no, you're not. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm far be it from me to criticise the Gazette, especially the sitting over there. Um, and I think he wrote the article as well. Um, I don't. I mean, I think even Hampshire would recognise <laughs> that they have a problem with people's perception of the quality of um, education in the borough they would argue that um, that actually is a false um, impression, that there is a lot of good work that is being done, but you can't get away from the fact that a lot of people are continuing to send their children out of the borough to be educated because they perceive that they will not get the level that they wish to have. That is, I think, something which will take a time to turn around. Um, there is due to be, in the very near future, um, a fairly major meeting, trying to bring the heads of schools in, along with Hampshire, in to talk and, and work out how we can have a plan. And my view has always been that an integral part of this is making sure that schools do not stay locked behind their walls and thinking of themselves as being a separate sector to the rest of things. They've got to get involved and they've got to become involved in dealing with some of the issues like the skills gap and other issues like that. They've got to be making sure that what they're preparing people for is the workplace environment in the way that the workplace environment wants, wants people to be prepared for it. So I think that there is um, a lot of work which, whilst we're not responsible for the education, we, we can do and we can say it positively. I think what was being talked about originally there was um, the um, particular situation in Bramley that rather got sort of enlarged into talking about other general areas. I think it was probably an unfortunate enlargement um, because um, not, I'm not suggesting that it was enlarged, unfortunately, by the person who wrote it, but it was just unnecessary to have enlarged it in that way. Um, I'd much rather we try and encourage everybody on the education side to work as closely as we can as being part of the total process. Do you support the idea of a free school, private school, being built on many down in that context that was described on Monday? Do you know, quite frankly, I've never given any thought. Um, I've, uh, we will have to build a school on many down. That's absolutely certain, I think. Um, we'll probably have to build more than one school on many down. Um, but what sort of um, school that should be, um, I've not given any thought to it.